Hello, my name is David Redwine, and let's talk a little bit about the origin of endometriosis. I'm going to talk to you about the theory of origin of a doctor, an old German doctor named Opitz, who subscribed to the embryonic mesoblast theory of origin. All of the early theories of origin of endometriosis were embryonic theories of origin. In 1882, Babs described endometriosis within a fibroid, and he pondered the question of, well, how did it get there? By embryonic rests, perhaps? In 1886, von Recklinghausen described patterns whereby deep endometriosis occurred in organs and places that had muscle tissue, like the sigmoid colon and the uterosacral ligaments or the bowel and the bladder. In 1900, Opitz came along and talked about Mullerian mesoblastic threads, which grow into the connective tissue of the pelvis during embryogenesis, resulting in endometriosis. If you recall from embryology, the mesoblast is early mesoderm. The, the mesoderm is the middle of the three embryonic layers. The ectoderm, uh, which is blue in this picture, is, uh, forms the skin and the brain. The endoderm forms the GI and GU mucosa, and the mesoderm forms everything else. In 1908, Klaja applied Opitz theory to deep endometriosis, and there things sat. All the questions of origin were answered, but plausible proof was lacking. Meanwhile, in the 1920s, a theory of origin based on cartoons arose. In the 1930s, radiation therapy was used to destroy ovarian function to treat endometriosis. In the 1940s, conservative excision and laparotomy was done, causing Joe Meggs to describe endometriosis as being a curable disease. In the 1950s, color televisions uh, were introduced. In the 1960s, birth control pills. In the 1970s, electrocoagulation. In the 1980s, danazol, and also my mullariosis theory of origin, which is basically an embryonic theory of origin. The 1990s brought laser vaporization of endometriosis, which does not always destroy even superficial disease, as you see here, but leaves carbon and neovascular adhesions behind. Also, the 1990s brought Lupron, which is associated with long-term ovarian dysfunction in about 25 to 30% of patients. The 2000s brought the robot, which showed that equivalent outcomes could be obtained more slowly and expensively. And most recently, Oralissa came along, which is not even equivalent to a low-dose birth control pill because it doesn't uh, work as a contraceptive. So by this time, by the late 20 teens, the wait is over because the genetic basis of the embryonic origin of endometriosis is being unraveled by genome-wide association studies of single nucleotide polymorphisms, as you see here in this example. And these show the uh, areas of analysis that were elevated in patients with severe endometriosis. And when you look at these various uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, they occur in places that are associated with embryonic development and estrogen response and angiogenesis and cell proliferation and some Hox genes are thrown in there and gene silencers and who knows what else will be discovered as time goes by. The mechanism of Opitz mesoblast uh, theory uh, begins at the moment of conception when the egg and sperm combine under their various genetic loads. By day 12 of embryonic life, bilaminar disc formation occurs, and this results in mesoderm formation from day 12 onward. This is what uh, mesoderm looks like uh, in schematic and in cross-section. And here is a uh, video of the process of gastrulation where cells of the epiblast are falling down through the primitive groove to become mesoderm, this red tissue. Mesoderm forms all reported locations of endometriosis, and endometriosis is a mesodermal act, uh, tissue. The mesoderm forms the coelom in its lining, the pelvic organs, the bladder and intestinal muscularis and serosa, but not mucosa, muscles, including vessel walls, kidney, ureter, lymph nodes, prostate, bone marrow, all places where uh, endometriosis all is mesoderm. Genetic expression uh, that is given at that genetic load is manifest as formation of abnormal mesoderm during embryogenesis. Here we see another uh, video of gastrulation in a chicken showing uh, somatic mesoderm and splanchmic mesoderm. This yellow 
splanch mesoderm is uh, compatible with the pelvic organs. And you can almost imagine during embryogenesis how some of these cells may just get left behind. This is all controlled by WNT notch and FN signaling. This is a diagram I drew in the 1980s showing my simple, uh, simple version of embryonic formation. You have the genital ridges on the posterior pelvic peritoneum. The G's stand for cells that are formed the gonad, the uh, ovary. The uh, U stands for uterine cells that are going to be forming the uterus. And E stands for endometriosis, cells that will be uh, in the endometrium. As time goes by, the cells begin to accumulate and aggregate into their separate uh, systems. The endometrial cells don't all make it into the uterus and they lie where they fell in their migratory pathways across the pelvis. This abnormal differentiation and migration of mesoderm results in embryologically patterned tissue tracts, not only of endometriosis, but also of surrounding tissue, which is metaplasia capable. These, are called, these can be called stem cells or pluripotential cells or totipotential solomic cells, uh, they've been called in the past. Metaplasia capable cells are also deposited alongside endometriosis, likely in gradients. Here we have a schematic cross-section of the peritoneum showing superficial endometriosis. Here's the peritoneal surface. Here the E represents endometriosis. The red indicates the areas of stem cells. The white indicates areas of no stem cells. If excision comes along and removes the area of endometriosis, but not all the stem cells surrounding it, then superficial recurrence is possible related to those remaining stem cells. If on the other hand, all the areas of endometriosis and stem cell surrounding it uh, is removed, you can have local cure. The same can be said for deep endometriosis, although the area of no stem cells may extend out, uh, be found further away from the lesions themselves. So recurrence after excision explain, is explained by this OPITS model. Endometriosis has been studied extensively in a variety of ways, tens of thousands of papers over the years. We have a massive amount of detailed subcellular information, but we've been looking at pine needles rather than the forest. If you look at endometriosis as uh, a related condition to other things, you immediately come up with endosalpingiosis, a related epithelial condition. But what about endocervicosis? It's rare, but it's also an epithelial condition that somehow is related. But what about also adenomyosis and fibroids? They both have muscular tissue. Adenomyosis also has glandular tissue. And so how, in some way, this is related to endometriosis. After that, you have the structural defects that are associated with endometriosis, and they fit in somehow, somewhere. Endometriosis in males has to be accounted for. And what this all means is, is that it brings up the question, is there a some kind of gene ensemble, I call it the Mulleriosis gene ensemble, that explains all of these things. We've been looking at one thing over here, endometriosis, but it's all related. Well, how would this Mulleriosis gene ensemble fit into the human genome? Well, it's obviously a part of the human genome, an important part, but uh, then everything, there's everything else in the human genome besides this Mulleri Mulleriotic gene ensemble. And in that gene ensemble are the various genes that you've read about and uh, that I've described, and there'll be others as time goes by. This gene ensemble results in abnormal differentiation and migration of mesoderm during gastrulation. And this leads to all of the cellular processes that we know are associated with endometriosis. And it also leads to ovulation defects, endometriosis in males, uh, and other peritoneal proliferations such as mesothelial rests or mesothelial cysts. And for each of these yellow uh, tissue types, there is genetically determined traits of uh, varying severity, including anatomic location, morphology, histologic activity, symptom severity, and malignant potential. And these traits range from none to severe for each of the uh, associated defects. So everything is patterned in utero. The order of frequency of pelvic involvement by endometriosis is most common in the posterior pelvis because that's the pathway of organogenesis of uh, the pelvic organs. And then you get the other muscular patterns of the uterocycle ligaments, such as described by von Recklinghausen. Embryologically patterned sites aren't located just in the pelvis. They're located around the body at extra pelvic sites. 
For instance, the right diaphragm is 10 to 1 favored over the left diaphragm. The right inguinal canal is favored 10 to 1 over the left inguinal canal. Right sciatic, 2 to 1 over left sciatic nerve. And these embryologically patterned uh, sites uh, may extend onto the abdominal wall itself and could be a cause of scar endometriosis related to metaplasia, related to the uh, growth factors of wound healing. These embryologically patterned mesodermal tracts also extend to a more subtle level, such as anti-mesenteric and anti-mesosalpingeal side of involvement of the bowel and the fallopian tube. The posterior pelvis is a site, uh, most common site, because it's in the pathway of organogenesis. And you got the von Recklinghausen pattern of deep endometriosis in muscular tissue. Patterns of intestinal endometriosis. This is my little chart of intestinal involvement in my patients. It'll look like the same chart from any surgeon with a lot of experience with intestinal involvement. The rectosigmoid colon is most commonly involved, followed by the terminal ilium, the appendix, the cecum, and rarely the transverse colon or jejunum. Another pattern of endometriosis is hidden seating of the bowel uh, of the colon. As you see here in these in this publication by uh, Horace Roman, you can see little islands of endometriosis in the mucosa, there, in the muscularis that are hidden uh, and can't be seen during surgery. The mucosa, by the way, is endoderm. The rest of it is mesoderm. And this is why the colonic mucosa is not a primary site of endometriosis because endometriosis is a mesodermal condition, not an endodermal condition. Another hidden uh, pattern that we see is hidden seating of the ovary, first described by William Russell in 1866. He described an area of endometriosis in the smack in the middle of the ovary with no apparent communication to the outside world. A related hidden pattern is seating of lymph nodes, first reported in 1897 by Emil Rice. Uh, this, this is located near nodular intestinal endometriosis. Analogous to these widespread seeding patterns is widespread superficial peritoneal disease. My personal path to, the embryonic, to an embryonic origin of endometriosis began in uh, 1987 when I found out that older age groups don't have more disease. And if disease is coming out of the fallopian tubes month after month, then over time, older age groups should have more disease, but they didn't. So that told me that Samson was wrong. Uh, then I found that uh, endometriosis can undergo an age-related evolution in color appearance. So this means that subtle disease can be present, but if you're not aware of what it looks like, it can be missed. And then uh, if you do another laparoscopy later, that subtle disease may be more obvious, which gives you a false impression of new disease. This led to my uh, adherence to an embryonic origin of endometriosis, which I uh, kind of certified back in 1988 uh, in this publication. Uh, this makes me the uh, physician who has supported an embryonic theory of origin exclusively longer than any other living physician. And in my paper, uh, I talked about the embryonic origin. I had a proof of concept of uh, endometri infant endometriosis in there. And because of these pattern tracks that are laid down, embryosis, endometriosis can be cured by excision if all those tracks are removed. And I showed that in a publication in 1991. And other authors are getting on to the embryonic uh, origin uh, bandwagon in various ways. Uh, one of the important features of an embryonic origin is if these tracks are patterned in the pelvis, then if you go in and if you remove all of those areas of endometriosis and the stem cells around them, although you don't know what the stem cells look, in, look like, then you can cure endometriosis in terms of no disease being found at reoperation. A 66% cure rate was noted following laparotomy excision and laparoscopy excision cure rates range between 57 and 100% with disease reduction in most of the others. And this is what led Joe Meggs in the 1950s to say that recurrence is not frequent and cure by conservative surgery is usual. No medicine eradicates endometriosis. 800 years before the Christian era, uh, Sashruta wrote that surgery has the advantage of producing instantaneous effects Hence, is the highest in value of all the medical tantras. Hippocrates, who was the father of deep endometriosis, he first described the uh, epidemiology and 
uh, physical findings of the disease, he wrote that diseases which medicines cannot cure, excision cures. Uh, it, there is a bright line that has been drawn between embryonic and therefore genetic theories of organ and postnatal autographs uh, re revolving around Samson's theory or some spinoff of that theory. Con there is convergence on the embryonic origin of endometriosis because different authors uh, have arrived at an embryonic origin from different directions during different epochs for whatever reason uh, they came to it. The actual embryonic mechanism will be identical for all embryonic theories. And here is a partial list of those who have uh, supported an embryonic origin of endometriosis over the years. Uh, as I said, back in 1988, I came to that realization. Uh, the convergence that's occurring with endometriosis uh, as an embryonic uh, origin type disease is contrast with the divergence that's occurring with reflux menstruation as the etiology of endometriosis because publications on reflux endometriosis, reflux menstruation highlight increasingly large and unreconciled differences and supporters are resorting to cartoons, fantasy and fabrication of evidence. And I said back in 1988 that the implantation theory will remain a gynecological windmill that people will joust against. So here's reflux menstruation. It predicts failure of all therapies because it will just come back next month. And so you have an unholy symbiosis between reflux menstruation and medical therapy and incomplete surgery because the failure that is predicted by reflux menstruation is provided by medical therapy, which does not eradicate endometriosis, and by incomplete surgery, which does not eradicate all endometriosis. Therefore, uh, these things provide proof of the incurability of endometriosis. This is the most dangerous theory in the history of medicine, given the number of women over the years that have been affected by uh, treatments which are based on this. Reflux is no longer needed to explain endometriosis in any location. The Opitz theory explains all. Endometriosis is not a random disease. It follows genetically dictated patterns. If you remove the patterns, you can cure the patients. And when you think that some medical fact is new, just review the old German literature. Opus was right, Samson was wrong, and thank you very much.